I'm going to talk about some problems or some issues that you guys are likely going to be facing here pretty soon. Um, one is disease. Um, I'm seeing sclerotinia on everything that's, you know, from a 30 bushel yield potential to a 75 bushel yield potential under irrigation, stuff that's been protected twice with fungicides. Um, you know, and that stuff, just pull me aside later, I'll be around all day and we can discuss that one on one. But right now I'm going to talk to you guys on time of swathing and how to figure that out. And then I'm, I've got some, uh, some natural enemies and some carabid beetles and stuff like that. And we're going to feed them some, uh, some lunch. So just kind of show you guys some natural enemies that are in the fields and, uh, you know, um, how to assess uh, whether you should spray or not for these late season insects that we might be seeing. So we'll start off by, um, by talking a little bit on um, time of swathing. Uh, this probably, it's looking like it's just going out of flower. Um, we're probably two weeks, maybe, maybe a little bit more than two weeks before we even consider swathing this once it goes out of flower. Um, but now's a good time to get in here and sweep um, because you only have really one more chance to, uh, to, give, um, to spray for lagus or any insects that you might find in here. So right when the crop's going out of flower, that's when I would go in there. And it's hard with some of those thick canopies that we've been seeing this year um, to walk in them. Uh, we are a little bit fortunate with lagus bugs because they don't have the edge effect. They usually come in out of the sky and they'll drop in fairly evenly throughout your field. So just try to get a few good sweeps in wherever you can. And then when you're in there, you can assess for your time of swathing. Most of the research that was originally done on the time of swathing, it was done with a little bit of different architecture of the plant. It had more main stem. And we all know that today our, um, our canola hybrids, they compensate so much. So if we just went by the main stem, I would say that that would be, you know, a third of our yield. Um, so we want to go where the majority of our yield is. That's where we want to take into consideration um, whether we should be swathing or not. And what we're looking for is 60% um, seed color change. So what would that look like? The, the plant matures from the bottom up. So I would start on the bottom pods of the main raceme start ripping them open and see if you start to get seed color change. The ones on the bottom, when you're getting um, close to ready to swath, I would say are going to be black. Um, they're going to be really firm. And then once you move up the, the plant and peel pods go up halfway, um, you know, you'll likely see some speckling starting. And consider any speckling as seed color change. So, and then at the very top, you'll, you'll pull them apart and then put them in between your thumb and forefinger. And if you can roll them and they're not squishy and um, you know, they're not falling apart, then you're likely getting close to that 60% seed color change. But you also wanna see ripening on the side branches as well. And don't mistake um, the plants dying off for maturity. You know, you have to go in, you can't, you can't check from the field or from driving by in your truck with your arm out the window. You can't tell if the crop's starting to ripen with canola. You can't tell by the pods, you have to pull them, pull them right apart. Often growers will mistake sun scalding for, for pod ripening and then pod ripening for maturity. And, and that's, that's not the case here. So every season we do get growers that, that do swath a little bit too early. Now, if I was a grower that only had a few acres of canola, um, you know, I would maybe wait until 60 or 70% seed color change. And that would likely depend on, on how well the pods are staying together and if, if there is a potential for shattering. It seems like if we leave it a little bit longer, our sample's a lot nicer. It often lowers our green count um, and our, our seeds are a little bit plumper. Hate it when we, when we um, go in there and we combine after we think we have this great crop and then a lot of it turns into the pepper, you know, or, or it gets blown out the back of the combine. So trying to save you guys as much yield as possible that way. And, you know, we've, it's kind of, what we would call low hanging fruit. You know, it's, we've, we've got the crop this far and it's, it's great looking. So we, we don't want to make any mistakes now by, by swathing too early. Um, and then also um, I'll caution you on swathing in the heat of the day. Um, anything above, you know, 28 degrees is, is getting too hot and you'll, uh, you will lock in green count. So it has to have that drying down period as well. Um, I'll get into straight cutting in a second. Great question though. Um, just lastly on, um, on swathing, uh, 
if we, if we have a, a crop that's really diseased or, or, or maybe we have 2,000 acres of canola and you're like, geez, I wish I would have got to that earlier. It's 90% seed color change. That kind of stuff, I would be swathing early in the morning when there's a heavy dew. Or, you know, if you have an opportunity to get out there for a light rain or if it's just a little bit moist, just to try to save the integrity of that pot as much as possible. Use the environment as much as you can, um, the, the weather as much as you can. <clears throat> Question on straight cutting um, canola. Been here getting lots of questions about that lately. Um, the Canola Council's view um, or comments on it is it's, it's still high risk. Um, it's one of those things that when you're ready to, when you're, when you make that decision to straight cut, you have to uh, be ready to drop everything and go in and combine once it's ready. Um, I would, um, you know, make sure that you have a home for it. If it's a grain dryer, grain bin with aeration, just in case it comes off a little bit moist, um, or if you can uh, put it in the uh, elevator system. But what we look for, for straight cutting is we look for that crop canopy that's well knitted together something that's, um, you know, that's not gonna shake loose completely. Like this wouldn't be a good candidate for me. Um, you know, it maybe has a, a decent yield potential, but I would probably be going for a 40 bushel to, uh, to a 50 bushel crop canopy, I think is something that I would consider for that uh, straight cutting. And I would, I would really start off on small acres. Um, it wouldn't be something I adopted right throughout my entire farm. Now, when you're considering straight cutting, it's a decision that you make at this time, right? It's, it's just before you would make the time decision to swath. And um, a trick that a colleague told me to, to decide whether you should consider straight cutting or not is when you're pulling the pods and you're checking for maturity, look to see how green the pods are. If they're staying really green and they're, they're really staying together, but the, uh, the seeds inside are really black, that means that the, uh, the pods probably are going to shatter a little bit less. So each hybrid that we have maybe has a little bit different um, shatter resistance in it, um, you know, and, and they don't really give us that information. And it's, it's seasonal, it's, um, and it's environmental somewhat as well. But um, peel the pods open, and if they're really green, and um, the pods are really green, but the seeds inside are really black, that might be a good candidate for you because uh, it, it's likely less prone to shatter. So what is your biggest concern then? Is that if it's not close knit and you go in it uh, and the wind comes along and kind of like that, it's just that yeah. little bit of vibration. Wind and shattering. So a comment that I heard from a grower yesterday was uh, he, he straight cut, um, he was getting 40 bushels. He went out the next day because they couldn't finish that night because of a breakdown and uh, he was at 30 bushels the next day. So he lost 25% uh, of his yield just because of the wind, um, you know, and it's one of those things where you have to be ready to go and, um, and start straight cutting. Um, I've heard a horror story of a, a guy in um, Drumheller who, you know, expecting one of the biggest yields ever, started booking his canola and, and also um, straight cutting. And, you know, he put himself at a lot of risk to, uh, to decide to uh, book all that canola. And um, he was expecting, you know, 45, 50 bushel yields on his dry land and um, he was down to 20 bushels in the best areas of his field. So it's, um, you got to make sure that, uh, or you got to, I guess, hope for, hope that it's going to stay together as much as possible. Once it starts shaking a lot, you can hear it even going through it, um, the pods sh uh, shelling and um, coming out. Do you think Question. it's less risky to swath it and have the wind come along and tumble your swaths away? Um, it is less risky from the Canola Council standpoint. Um, that's... Uh, you know, if we can anchor that crop in at all to, um, you know, cut it as, we like to cut it as low or as high as possible so then we have something to anchor it into. But, um, yeah, it's one of those things where we like to cut with prevailing winds. And I, I know what you guys are thinking. You guys are thinking, well, I had to pick my canola up in my neighbor's field last year or in my fence lines. Um, and, um, but still, as a whole, I think that your risk is going to be higher at straight cutting. Any pod sealants that are of any? Pod sealants, um, that's a great question. Um, there's not really a lot of research, I don't think, to, uh, to back all that. Ron, can, do you, can you speak on that at all, uh, pod sealants? No, I haven't done any work on it personally. I, I, I've heard 
heard some guys like it. The jury's still out. Yeah, I think that's a good comment. The jury is still out. Um, I don't think that we've seen enough replicated data to support it. The Canola Council um, were research driven. Um, but, uh, you know, I have heard good things and I have heard, um, you know, haven't seen anything for a difference. So I've heard both. Yeah, for sure. Please um, do. I think some of the pot seals, because you guys aren't getting enough water volume on there, and, and the lower pots are the ones that are typically riper than the top ones. Yeah. If you don't get those bottom pots coated, you're, the pot sealers are not going to work. Okay? So virtually irrigation is about the only way you're going to get enough water on there to coat those pots. Okay? That's a good comment, yeah, because the plant, like we say, does mature from the bottom up, so those are the ones that you're likely going to want to protect. Are you looking then at a uh, crop that's standing better? Like some of the irrigation, of course, where the water's hitting and stuff like that, it's laying down a little bit. Is it okay like that to straight cut it then? Like you're saying roughly is a 40 to 50 bushel range if it's placed tight mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that, it's probably optimal. I, um, I don't know a lot of growers that um, straight cut their irrigated canola. Um, I, I can't think of any off of hand. Um, Tim Wilms, stump me. This guy gets a flashlight and a kick in the butt. Um, and how does he make out with it, Ken? What is you his have comments? To desiccate. Have to desiccate. So. Desiccate, it's just 100% necessary. And I think one of the big things is the pods are all ready to go, but you got greeter and heck stalks. Okay. And that's tough to run that stuff through the combine too. So sometimes the regone is really more just to dry that down. So I've also heard the comment that um, growers with the Liberty Link systems will put down a glyphosate um, and use that as a desiccant, and it's it's not a desiccant, but uh, um, but at least you know you're combining, I guess, in two weeks, right, or two and a half weeks. Uh, but Reglone would be the pro push behind it is is to not lose as much seed, right? That's right. So, and then we've had you've well, had and like you too. made the comment about the stalks as well to be able yeah. to get it through the combine. Well, I, th I think the other thing that I've noted, I, I tried it last year. Yeah. The seed size is so tremendously bigger, yeah. much bigger on the stuff that's left standing, uh, that you do make up some yield on that. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. So there is some gain out of that. Mm -hmm. I know you're probably losing some to shatter, yeah. but to me, it's looking like we used to cut all our wheat too. Yeah. You know, and obviously the genetics have helped along the way, but. I'm, I'm thinking more and more like yeah. uh, and lots of growers are giving us that comment as well and and the canola council agronomists are trying to get more information or, or more research dollars to get us better information on that but as far as it goes right now our standpoint is start small if you do try it um, I wouldn't adopt it throughout the entire farm um, and just because it's worked one year on your farm you know it, it's not replicated and it might you know you might sting you yet but um, I think that um, I think that you are doing it right, um, you know, um, by just yeah, trying it and seeing how it works. Um, any other comments on straight cutting? Anybody else have any other experience with it? I think it's already come and gone, but there were some people who were rolling the crop at about this stage, flattening it down so it would not shatter, but then getting it to dry was still so a challenge. Yeah, with those pusher headers or whatever, yeah. I've seen some video on those, um, and that again, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't really support. Um, I haven't seen the research on it, um, but uh, you know that I would small start with really small acres. Maybe give it to Ken to try here. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take you guys into some insects now. Um, insects that we're looking for in this time of year would be um, lagus bug, I guess, birth armyworms, um, and. In the plots over here, I actually found lots of uh, cabbage seed pod we weevil uh, exit holes. And um, do you guys... Also adult weevils here too. I actually have one if anybody wants to see. I've got lots in the sweep net here too. Thanks, Ken. Um, so a way to tell whether you should have sprayed or not for cabbage seed pod weevil, which is kind of a neat little trick, and I'll, I'll show you guys. You pull some plants in fall time and count the amount of pods with um, exit holes on them. If 25% of them have holes on them, then you should have sprayed for your seed pod weevil. Um, so I'm going to show you what the exit holes look like. I'm going to show you some carabid beetles, some of the ground beetles that we have, and we're going to feed them some lunch. I maybe overfed them yesterday, but they usually perform pretty well here. Everybody know what this is? Nobody probably seen this this, this year? 
Astro Yellows, was there any of that this year? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm going to pass these around. These are the exit holes that I were fi was finding on the um, on that crop over there for uh, the seed pod weevils. So I'm sure that all you guys have seen them. And um, so count those and if on your main raceme, or I guess on your plants, and if you find 25% have exit holes that um, you should have sprayed. Uh, 25% have exit holes, AKA the crab and beetle. So you guys might want to gather around, take a look. Those are ground beetles. We'll find those all over um, Southern Alberta here. So um, I really want you guys to realize that insects are a hard thing to determine whether you should spray or not. We give these blanket recommendations of one lagus per sweep. And um, you know, you really have to take into consideration how healthy is your crop and how healthy is the insect population. And also I think we have to consider what's in there for beneficial insects. So here I caught, I think it was an alfalfa. Oh no, this is a zebra caterpillar worm. Seen some of these uh, all over the prairies. It's um, a white strip and then a black strip and then yellow sides. He's going to be lunch. Um, hope you guys can see in there. I'm going to try to get him right in the middle. I've got a little bit to feed him here. Oh, right there in the middle it is. Uh, they're the carabid beetles. And then, so here I have diamondback moth larvae, and they really like those. The carabid beetle, there's one in there that's a little bit bigger than the rest. Kind of grosses my wife out, but um, he, uh, he beats everybody up and climbs on their back. And I call him Ken Coles. <laughs> so these are the diamondback moth larvae. They hang from a thread we can see there. That's a telltale sign. That's about as large as they get before they pupate. Hey, yeah. wake up, guys. Want some of this? <laughs> so yeah, look at the four there just going to town. You can see that zebra caterpillar worm just getting ripped apart. Hey, that's why we don't spray when we're just going over our fields with a herbicide application or a fungicide application. We want to protect our beneficials and make sure that we're at least at our thresholds before we spray. Um, so many times I hear the comment, oh, well, Matador is only four bucks, Thesis is five, you know, or whatever. I'm just going to throw it in the tank. It's a drop in the bucket at this point. We want to protect our beneficial insects. There's so many in the crop canopy. I'll show you what else I found. So once we do do our sweeps, a good way to tell what's in your crop, steal your wife's produce bags. Step one. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> so right there, first thing I see is a lady beetle. That's a beneficial. They eat birth armyworms. They're a great insect. So I'm just going to get you to hang on to that. I'm all thumbs today. And then we'll just take the sample, put her in the produce bag. It's got air holes, so that's why I like it. It deflates a little bit. Hopefully I don't have any bees in here. Yeah. So I seen a um, larvae of a lady beetle in there right away. If anybody can point it out, I'll have a door prize for them. Cam, that's a salute. I noticed uh, as I walked in the field there too, there's a whole schwack load of these and people kind of mistake them for something they want to kill. Exactly. See, Doug, I told you. But that's so right actually there, a, a that's, yep. ladybug larva. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. And they'll, you'll see their, um, their carcass pretty much stuck right on there. Look at that. He's just head bopping. Wake up. So, yeah, we, you'll find those. Um, oh, new lip stand. Yeah. <laughs> he's talking to you. Hey, you guys. So, yeah, he'll, he's a beneficial. He, he looks like he's maybe feeding on the stalk or the stem. Um, that's a beneficial insect. We don't want to hurt him. Um, but this guy right here, I don't really know what he is. Um, maybe Ron can help me out. He's kind of a generalist. Is that a caterpillar? Just a caterpillar of some sort. I don't know. Uh, 
So I'm gonna do some more feeding here and see if these guys oh, yeah, will look at these guys, they're still going nuts. Look at those carabid beetles. They'll eat anything. Oh, I'm hungry. So they're gonna eat the canola or they're eating No, they're eating the uh, the pests that we have. So they're beneficial They're beneficial insects. So we have so many beneficial insects. We have the damsel bug. How about the ladybug? Lady beetle, great beneficial insects. We can really see flea beetles in here, mm -hmm. um, cabbage seed pod weevils. So the weevils have the long snout that does the sucking sort of. I have a, a large weevil here just to kind of let you know what it looks like and then beside it the uh, seed pod weevil. So I'll just pass those around. Um, other insects to consider in the sweep net would be lagus bug. I thought we would find more here. Um, but I have lots of samples here if you guys want to look at them. So when was this swept and where? Uh, behind you 40 minutes ago. Oh. 20 minutes wow. ago. And that was only like three or four sweeps. So there's lots in there and, and there's lots of neutral insects in there. Here's a lagus bug right there. Well, maybe that's, oh no. I did see an, an alfalfa bug in here, which we often confuse as lagus bugs. The only difference is in appearance, I think, is they're a little bit longer and a little narrower. Here's a damsel bug. That's a beneficial insect. He'll, um, he'll eat lots, this guy. So this caterpillar, he's got no chance in there. There's too many beneficials. Was we have some pollinator. No, I would say not, but I, I, didn't, I don't know for no, sure. No, so there's lots of seed pod weevils in here. We're likely going to see damage later on. There's the lady beetle larvae. That's when you just show the front of the stem? Yes, okay. yeah, for sure. Um, and then all these wasps that we see are often either neutrals or they're pollinators, and some are parasitic wasps. And they'll lay their, their eggs right inside the, um, right inside caterpillars, uh, you know, or um, cutworms that, that um, feed right at the ground level. I'm sure we've seen some of those this year in this area, cutworm damage. So when they tell us to put a certain rate on for certain insects and stuff like that, are we salvaging some of the, the uh, good insects then? Um, the rates we're putting on? If, if we're yeah. following? If you're labels? following the labels, then you are protecting the beneficials. But that's also not only rates, but that's time of day. Okay. You know, um, yeah, there's lots of weevils in there. And that was only a few sweeps. No, he's he's more of a soft sort of like he'll eat the eggs. Yeah, there's a lagus for sure. Seed production, seed canola producers here. That's just a fly. Um, you know, it almost looks like um, it's something to do with cattle. I can't even remember, like uh, not a dung beetle so fly. These, uh, these black beetles, do you buy the, these beneficials? Can you buy them? You buy them by the truckload. Or <laughs> drop I, them on the plane. How do you do that? Um, only spray so one. Parasites. Exactly. Uh, you know the comment I hear a lot often from growers is, uh, I, "I've never sprayed before, Troy, and I sprayed this year or last year. And now it seems like I'm going to have to spray every single year." And the reason yeah. that is is because maybe they didn't follow the rates or they didn't spray at the right time, and they killed those beneficials in that in that climate in that microclimate in the field in that area. And it takes a long time for that beneficial population to build up. So um, I really advise people to protect your pollinators and um, and all your beneficials. So you, you mentioned time of day. What's the preferred time of day then? It all depends, I guess. Um, if you're going for birth army worms in the heat of the day, they're not out there anyway. They, they like to hide underneath the leaf litter. So um, have you seen on weeds? 8 o'clock till 7 in the morning. Great time. You have... Um, uh, you have most of your beneficials are likely underneath the canopy a little bit more. They, they like to go out and feed during the day. Um, there are some that are night, but um, like the wasps and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, 8 o'clock at night to 7 in the morning because that's when you'll get the best kill. Seed pod weevil, um, usually we do that at flowering at 20% bloom. Um, you know, and I wouldn't spray seed pod weevil too early. People will see seed pod weevil in their bud cluster and be like, oh, I'm already at two per plant, I should spray. That's not the case. Canola pretty much knows what it's going to produce by the amount of available moisture and nitrogen that it has. So it's going to compensate. Canola is a great plant. It's, people call it, it's like a weed, they say. And it'll just shoot out another branch. It knows that it's getting attacked. So that early feeding, don't worry about it. You will see blanks, you know, 
but um, I, it wouldn't bother me. I would um, wait for that entire invasion to happen of the seed pod weevil. If you spray too early, you might have to spray again once it starts to flower because they're really attracted to those yellow fields. And with seed pod weevil, don't just go in the edge of your field and sweep. You know, that's one that you have to go all the way into the middle because they, they have an edge effect. They'll come in from the borders and then they'll, um, and they'll do their damage. And sometimes you can get away with just doing two spray booms uh, on, the, on the edge of your field, so. What is it, uh, what about what your, if your neighbor's canola fields are flowering and this is just coming to bloom? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, my um, my predecessor Matthew Stanford said, you know, it sure pays off seeding two days, um, two days after my my Hutterite um, growers beside me or whatever, because they have to spray every year and they spray early for the seed pod weevil and it pretty much controls them. So he really likes that strategy, <laughs> um, and he gets to protect his beneficial insects. So. You know, and that's another good comment that those fields that are first seeded and first flowering are the ones that you really have to pay close attention to, right? You have to, um, they're the ones that gonna get, are going to get attacked by the early insects. Um, you know, they're, they're, um, they're attractive to those, those insects. Um, flea beetles were a large problem this year as well. <laughs> Same applies for, for pea leaf weevil and peas too. For always the first seeded peas are going to have the highest concentration. I really, I swept it at budding and bolting, and it's amazing. You hmm. still saw threshold levels of seed pod weevil, and ours were late canola fields compared to a bunch of neighbors. And as soon as it got to flowering, there were way more beneficials in the same level of seed pod weevil. So if yeah. you can... Good you comment. Can yeah, if you can wait. And like I say, the canola plant will compensate. So, um, and you want to wait for that entire invasion. So getting back to your question of time of day, 20% uh, bloom is when we usually like to first start spraying for seed pod weevil because seed pod weevils do their damage once the pods reach 40 mils so an inch and a half and that's when the majority of the egg laying starts happening the feeding on the buds isn't the damage that they do it's the uh it's the egg laying in the in the pods and it's when the um the young leave the pod i guess they the exit holes um and it ruins the integrity of the pod so that's that's where um that's where they do their damage so spray at 20 percent bloom and um, for the seed pod weevil, um, you know, that's, that's one that often gets mixed in with the fungicide application at 20 or 30% bloom. So, you know, I still think that you should be spraying early, early in the morning or, um, or later at night for those. And we probably have some room to learn on that too. Exactly. And, and you know, that's, I've been the insect specialist with the Canola Council for three years now. And... Um, there's so much black and white and that's what I'm supposed to give my messaging but what I've realized especially with the seed pod weevil it's more like 50 shades of gray than any black and white with um, with insects any insects so I think that the thresholds we it's, it's a lot larger matrix we have to consider the plant health and how robust and what our yield potential is people think oh I've got this great crop it's maybe gonna yield 60 bushels or 40 bushels or 50 bushels I usually get 25 I should protect it. I should be spraying my insecticide. Well, that's not really the case. Maybe a fungicide you should be protecting it with, but the plant is going to compensate for that early feeding. Um, so I think that, yeah, I think that that's kind of lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, I think that, um, that that's where we should be protecting. Um, when we have uh, um, all our beneficials in the crop canopy we should be taking into consideration that when we when we consider our thresholds you know and in the heat of the day um, you know they'll move up and down in the canopy so sometimes we don't get that great scout as well so um, you know we don't know everything there is about insects um, but we do know that we want to save our beneficials as much as possible they didn't like this guy hey well, they didn't want him. we'll let him go oh my goodness <laughs> looks like that <laughs> no doubt <laughs> Maybe throw that dog of autumns in there next. <laughs> okay, guys. Can you do one thing for me, and that's explain what exactly is 20% flowering? I don't know that everybody really knows. Well, we're past that point, so no. Well, you'll have to catch me next year. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so, I think that's different to everybody, right? Yeah. Um, there's lots of good guides online. Um, I'm just trying to go off memory here. I think it's... Uh, 15 open flowers on the main raceme um, is 20% bloom. Um, Ron, is that correct? 15, is it 15 to 17? 
Yeah, um, flowers on the main raceme. But it's really difficult to gauge that when we have poor plant stands, when we have two or three plants per square foot. But if we have seven plants per square foot, it's pretty easy because our plants often look more like this, yeah. you know. But if we have those um, two or three plants per square foot, you have to take into consideration the branching as well. and. Um, you know, it becomes a real management issue. So we really preach the stand establishment message as much as possible. But as far as 20% bloom, look for, you know, 17 or 15 open flowers on the main stem, main raceme. Um, so you're talking about for fungicide timing and no, oh, for, for insects, for insects still, yeah. I, I, so uh, what you have to consider then for seed pod weevil is they do the majority of their leg egg starts once the pods reach 40 mils. So once you start to see pods reaching 40 mils, that's when they're gonna start laying their eggs. And they could lay them even later. Um, Lloyd Dostal's done most of the research on this stuff and he says that the seed pod weevils can reinvade up to three times. So, you know, we don't want to, um, we don't want to have to go in there twice with our insecticide and, and nuke that if we can get away with just one pass. And what about, I guess, timing as far as I guess trying to manage the best way or the best timing so that you don't have to spray as often if you're doing multiple passes and stuff like that. Is there, you know, like wheat midge, if you if you do uh, wheat earlier, you're going to miss that cycle kind of thing. Is there some So we are doing research that um, like often growers that spray for seed pod weevil don't have to go in and spray for lagus later on. Um, and you know, like I say, it's it's just... It's different on every case and every season and how healthy the population is. And, you know, a way to consider the beneficial insect piece, I think, is like the, uh, you know, like the coyote and, and the rabbit. You know, it, it kind of goes like this, um, how, how well they're doing in the fields. Once the uh, pest population sort of peaks, then the beneficials are right behind it. And then the beneficials will, will kind of follow them. So, you know, it, it's one of those sort of situations. Um, and you know what's going to happen this year might might be different next year. Um, this year we had the humidity and the and the heat, um, and we had diamondback moths showing up in April, and everybody's thinking that we're going to have insects galore. Um, and you know every time I went out there in the sweep net, I found more beneficials in my sweep net than I did pests. So I, I know that the beneficials did do uh, their job in a lot of cases. Um, you know maybe didn't um, clean them out completely. I was still finding pests for sure but kept them right about at that threshold level. And keep in mind that our thresholds, I think, are a little bit conservative because most of the research we did were, was on Q2 and West Star. So we all know those old varieties and um, we all know that the, the plants that we're using today, except for Ken's, can compensate a lot better. Pretty poor looking stand there. Yeah. But, um, What's he talking about now? God, you've turned mouthy lately. <laughs> Um, and you know, some questions here. no, I think that that's all I have. I want to thank you guys for, for, for your attention. Um, if you guys have any more questions, I'm going to stick around here as long as possible. And, um, I think next stop is coffee. Joy, can you talk about, uh, leaf hoppers? Oh, it leaf seems hoppers. Like there's a lot of, there's going to be a lot of guys spraying 50 times next year. <laughs> yeah. So, yes. Aster yellows. Mm -hmm. And they stick out like. Well, I'm not going to use, I'll save that one for you later. <laughs> like Canada straight bar. <laughs> um, so they, they stand a lot more erect because they are, there's not much in them. They, um, you, they really stick out this time of year. Um, the leaf hoppers this year, we've seen in our yards walking out to our vehicle in the morning. You could see the ground kind of moving. I didn't catch any in this sample that I seen. Um, so what I know about leaf hoppers is about 20% of them have um, what would the disease be? Um, phytoplasma. The phytoplasma that, that causes the aster yellows. Um, and, and I guess, you know, maybe Ron should be speaking on this. He's probably rolling his eyes at me right now behind those glasses. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Is he still here? <laughs> um, so once we see infection, I think it'll be on every or like once the infection happens, it'll be on every um, every bud or every plant on that on that branch, right? Depends how systemic it goes. How systemic it goes. Okay, so this year we're seeing anything from you know less than a percent to I've heard up to ten percent damage for uh, aster yellows. 
Um, you know, I, I don't really know what you can do. Um, some guys got lucky by spraying early with um, um, for flea beetles and didn't really have to worry about them. Um, you know, other than that, I can't really can't really comment much on them. The aster leafhopper is the primary species that carries the phytoplasma to canola and other crops, but there are other leafhopper species that do. We have two populations of leafhoppers. One is called a migrant population, and that generally comes up from the south. And this year, the migrating leafhoppers, I know, came into Manitoba as early as May, and they were already carrying the phytoplasma with them. And so there were heavy uh, outbreaks of aster yellows in canola and even cereals in Manitoba. And, and uh, uh, Troy mentioned 10 to 20 percent. I think they'd be happy if that's all they had. There, Some fields, I think, are basically a write-off. Um, the leafhopper, once it feeds on the plant, it introduces the, the microorganism, the pathogen, to the sap stream. It feeds in the phloem tissue of the plant. And then the uh, phytoplasma reproduces. And what it does is it causes abnormal development of the flowers. Instead of forming normal pods, the flowers either end up aborting or they form pods that are, are soft and bladder-like. Astriellus goes to hundreds of plant species. Uh, although it favors broadleaf uh, plants, it will also go to grasses and cereals. So in southern Alberta, we're very fortunate that we're not on the main flyway for the migrating populations. They generally show up here a month or so later than they do in, in say, uh, southern Manitoba. Uh, we also have native leafhoppers that would feed on the aster yellows uh, where it might have overwintered in alfalfa and other perennial crops, and then there'll be some local spread. But uh, for aster yellows, you need to be monitoring for the leafhoppers, and, and there are tests actually that you can do on the leafhoppers to determine if they're carrying the phytoplasma. Uh, the potato growers are very concerned about it, and they have had a, a, a little pilot project monitoring uh, aster yellows movement into potatoes. So. Uh, it's, it's a year-to-year -year thing. Some years we, we get no migration and other years we do, so it just happened that this year was one of those so years. So is there any monitoring that, that we do for that then, Ron? Um, or is there any alert system that we can let growers know? Well, in, in the leafhopper prone areas, the answer is yes. There are entomologists out there that are sweeping mm. and monitoring. In fact, some, some follow the leafhoppers from from Texas and Oklahoma when they migrate up through the Midwestern US and they're giving the growers in the northern states advance warning that they're coming. Otherwise, you know, you have to capture the, the leaf hoppers and you can have them tested for the phytoplasma. But a lot of people will just monitor the leaf hopper numbers and when they see them coming into their fields, they're gonna to start to spray right away. Vegetable growers like carrot growers, uh, Astriales is a deadly disease because the carrot roots develop a lot of side roots and they're very bitter, so the crop is of, of no value. Seed potato growers with purple top, that's what the disease is called, that's a big downgrade for their seed potatoes. So they're using um, uh, generally yellow water pans or yellow sticky traps that uh, attached at, at, uh, will trap the uh, leafhoppers. And then based on the counts that you're seeing, and you can also sweep them, they do tend to congregate first at the perimeter of the field and move their way in and then you're you're spraying preventatively there's no way to cure the aster yellows once it's in a plant so you're monitoring for the leaf hoppers and when they first start to show up you're spraying for them and often it may take multiple sprays to control and them. they'll have an edge effect into the field they can yeah, yeah. Okay. particularly the natives that are overwintering say on the perennial forages and stuff at the edge of the field they'll move into the crop and Otherwise, they, they may just fly and disperse randomly in the crop and you can find isolated plants throughout the field in that case. Great. In horticulture, they use soapy solutions for control. I don't know if that's practical in the well, field or not. Well, yeah, it's more for ornamentals yeah. and things like that, the insecticidal soaps. So, but yeah. You need a quick, a quick knockdown for leafhoppers because each plant they feed on, they potentially introduce the phytoplasma. So is it possible that we're seeing a difference in the virulence of the pathogen? Well, the, the aster hopper occurs, or the um, aster yellow's phytoplasma occurs in many different strains, and some are specific or prefer potato, for example, over carrot. 
Uh, I don't know, there, there's a scientist at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in um, Saskatoon, Christelle Olivier is her name, and she works full-time on the aster leafhopper. They brought her on back in the late 2000s when there was, uh, was 2007, around that there was mm -hmm. a bad outbreak, and so she's been on staff ever since, and um, be a good idea some, sometime to invite her to come out and speak here in Alberta. She knows a lot about the leaf hoppers and she works prairie wide, so I wouldn't be surprised that she's she'll be out to Alberta if she hasn't been doing some sweeping and stuff too. It's rare that we don't see it. it like I was in Pittsburgh yesterday and they were complaining about it. Every field of canola I've been in, I've seen it. Yep. They were talking about seeing it in barley. One yep. guy thought he had it in wheat. So, yep. you, you know, it's, it's everywhere, but in reality, is it that bad? I, I guess. You well, see, we, we do see it, it's really ugly, and, and oh, it's killing right. my crop, and oh my god, I saw one in the yeah. field, and you know, we got to sell the farm and have an auction sale, and it's terrible. Yeah. We, see, we see some of it every year, let's yeah. put it that way. But it's if, if you start to see, you walk through your crop, and there's leaf hoppers going every way, you know you're potentially in trouble if you've got potatoes, carrots, lettuce, any of these susceptible crops, canola. So, you, you know, they. There's usually, uh, if, if Aster Yellows is a risk, there's an entomologist somewhere who's going to be monitoring and pressing the warning button. In Manitoba, they've had, they have weekly newsletters on their potato system there, and they've been warning about Aster Yellows for weeks. Great, thanks, Ron. Stump me. <laughs> I guess we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up. Please join me in thanking Troy for uh, a wonderful module. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. I'm going to uh, feed these guys one more time so whoever didn't get a view can uh, come and take a look. You'll be doing that the whole way home, won't you? That's right, and at night. Yeah. We're, we're not going to be talking about it much either, but during your coffee break, if you're interested, we do have some fertility matrixes set up uh, with a number of different products in canola. So you can kind of wander around. There are some, some kind of interesting things showing up in, in these trials. We also have it for wheat here, but otherwise, uh, where'd Jason go? There's a screen in there, and yes, I have. <laughs> Once you um, use your aspirator and get more than five lagus, they send off a, an alarm pheromone, actually, and it, it doesn't taste very well, and, and I learned the hard way. <laughs> so we have one diamondback moth larvae right in the middle there. I'll let you guys gather around. I see it two or three times a day. <laughs> Swapping and swapping, I've seen that. Are they performing at all for you? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, I'm gonna see if uh, we can throw this big caterpillar in here. They didn't like his cousin, and this guy's a little bit bigger, but we'll see. Hey guys. I don't know if there's. A, oh, there he goes. They've got him now. Oh, holy wow. Pretty cool. You could hear the screaming in the buzzword. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's good though. That's the uh, natural selection, all that good stuff. Um, they've got to eat too. They definitely need more than one to control them. Yeah. You see, that would be that caterpillar's attack system is his hairs, his hairs and yeah. um, his speed. We've seen that he was pretty quick, especially after we had him and his cousin in there. Yeah. So yeah, carabid beetles, um, once they get full, they'll, they'll dig down into the ground here. Last night I couldn't find any on top. They all burrowed into the uh, little bit of soil that I have there. But um, you know, pretty fascinating um, what's going on in the canopy. I think that we need to start informing people on what's in there for beneficials, not pests. So these big beetles, do they show up before any of the other insects do? Um, one generation a year for the carabid beetle, and um, they do show up a little bit earlier. Um, you know, than, than a lot of our soft body caterpillars and stuff like that. So what they're going to be attacking. I have these guides that I, that I printed offline and then I just cut them up and then laminate them. They're uh, natural enemies uh, to the Pacific Northwest. And they've got everything in here. Um, they've got our lady beetles, um, some of our flies. The lacewing larvae is probably my second favorite uh, to the carabid beetle. Um, they have, uh, we've all seen the lacewing, I think, in the fields. Um, they have uh, the larvae stage, 
Um, they almost look like an alligator and they've got these side pinching parts, uh, mouth parts, and they'll, um, any soft body caterpillar, they'll just, or aphids, they'll um, suck the juices right out of them until you can't even, like they're usually green because of all the plant material they eat, and they'll suck it right out so there's barely any green inside of them, so they're pretty fascinating. Um, and then here we have a damsel bug. I did find one in there, um, so that's these guys here, and they'll attack lagus, the damsel bug, lagus nymphs, lagus adults. Um, uh, stink bugs, assassin bugs. We see those often in cartoons and in um, in our sweep nets. So there's um, there's lots going on in the in the crop canopy, and lots that I don't know as well.